Okay, uh, so before we get started, um, I think I sent all of you an email about this, but I did just want to note, again, that like overall, this was the best batch of exams I've had in a long time from a class, so it was actually a pleasure to go through and grade all of these. Um, now that said, I do want to ask if there are any questions that you guys have about the exam or about midterm grades or anything like that. We'll start talking about final projects next week. But yeah, Jamal. What does the participation grade come from? Uh, the participation grade basically comes sort of from your, your presence and level of activity in class. Um, so if you are here more often, you get more participation points. If you speak up more often, you get more participation points. So that's, that's where the participation grade comes from. Um, any other questions about midterm grade or about the exam or projects or anything else? Okay, yeah. And you know, one thing that I do want to know, right, you know, um, because I know people get a little twitchy at midterm, um, is that everybody's doing fine, right? Um, you're all making good progress. Um, I'm pleased with how the class is coming along. Um, so nobody has anything to worry about as long as you stay the course, right? Okay. So let's talk then about industrialism in the Victorian period. So these uh, things that I gave you to read for today, what, did, uh, what struck you about? Was there anything that was particularly surprising or eye-opening about any of these texts? Okay, the naked children in the mine. Okay. Now, is it what was particularly shocking about that? Was it just the fact that there were children working? Was it the fact that they were working in a mine? Was it the fact that was it was the state that they were in in the mine? They were just so deep in the mine. I can't exactly remember why they were naked. I uh huh. Think it was either they just did not have clothes. Of their own, or uh -huh. it was because it was so dirty in the mine. Yeah, and dirt, dirty and hot, right? So traditionally, um, in a lot of mine operations, yeah, miners typically work with relatively few clothes on. And a lot of that is because it's hot in the mine, it's dirty, and on top of that, clothes can get caught on things and you can get, you can get injured, right? So yeah, so um, it, it, it's not necessarily abnormal for people in a mine to be in a state of undress. But it strikes us as weird that there are nine-year-old children working in a mine, right? Anything else that struck you guys as uh, weird or surprising about any of these texts? Not really weird, but like the, how they were describing money, it was confusing. Okay. Yeah, the old si okay, yeah, the, the old system of British currency is not a decimal system, right? It's not based on multiples of a hundred. So it can be a little bit confusing to understand just how much money they're talking about, right? Um, there is in the back of the book a useful conversion chart that helps you understand uh, how much each denomination is worth in relation to others, right? But to give you some sense of how much money we're talking about generally, I think that the place where this is most relevant in the text I gave you for today is on page 650 in the article about the London match workers, um, where the original five pound shares in the company are quoted for, sa for sale at 18 pounds, seven shillings, six pence, right? Now that doesn't sound like very much money to us, right? But one thing to note is that under the old British system, 18 pounds, 17 shillings, six pence is worth over $2,000 in today's money, right? So what's happening here is that the shares in this, in this match company are selling for over $2,000 a share, right? Which is huge. Like even by today's standards, that's an enormous amount of money. So, Britain is on a system of decimal currency now, 
But, you know, I, I can give you, um, uh, I'll give you a link to a website that can do those kinds of conversions for you so that when you run across these figures, you can, um, you can understand exactly how much money we're talking about. Because I get that that can be confusing. Um, other issues that you guys found interesting or surprising or confusing here? shocking how little regard they had for the children's safety because when they uh -huh. tried to put themselves first they got punished for it like yeah they got shocked. yeah people lost limbs and they got really hurt and at least by 1888, when we're talking, when we're talking, about, I think you're talking about the stuff in the match, uh, the match factory, right? Um, the girl who is fined for letting, uh, for letting the web trust, basically letting a machine get damaged so that she doesn't cut her own fingers off, right? Um, <clears throat> by that point, by 1888, we are at least not talking about very young children anymore. By that point. Um, I believe you had to be at least 14 to work in a factory in Britain. Not in the US. Child labor law actually moved a lot more slowly here. But uh, yeah, in Britain, by this point, you're talking about people who are at least teenagers working in the factories. However, in the earlier period, in the 1840s, with, with the, the children's employment condition was looking at uh, issues in the mines, right? Children of any age were permitted to work, not only permitted, but often encouraged to work. Um, and <clears throat> even when laws were put in place, they were weakly enforced, in part because most political power, both in cities and in parliament, rested in the hands of the people who ran the companies, right? So one thing that we begin to see happening in this period of British history, right? We see a stark divide between north and south. Where northern England becomes the country's industrial heart, right? Northern England becomes uh, dominated by factories, by industrial operations. So cities like uh, Manchester, Newcastle, and Liverpool, as well as smaller cities like Preston and Lancashire, become major industrial centers, right? Wigan in the north of England becomes a huge mining center, right? Because one thing that industrialism demands, right, it becomes a huge demand for iron and for coal. And most of this early industry is built around the production of cheap textiles, right? So pretty much all of, like, even all of that coal mining that's going on is you know, it's being done to either make iron to build machines or to provide fuel for machines that'll power looms that'll turn out cloth, right? Now the south of England is actually kind of split in two ways. The southwest remains rural and agricultural. And is also pretty sparsely populated. The area around London, however, is the financial and political center of Britain. So this creates a bit of a political problem in the way electoral districts and seats are, are drawn and the way seats in parliament are parceled out. Essentially, they're parceled out by tradition and by, you know, sort of like old feudal land boundaries, right? So, you know, like this, you know, the, the, the lands of this particular earl send one person to parliament. In the lands of this particular duke send one person to parliament, so on and so forth, right? They're not apportioned by population, which means 
that Southern England remains more politically powerful than Northern England, even though Northern England is where all the money is being made right now, right? So this leads in particular to bad conditions for working people who already lack real representation in government, right? So we'll get to the child labor issue in a moment, right? But like all of this is kind of building up to that. So there was a movement in Britain from 1838 to 1857 called Chartism. And the Chartists were working class activists who were trying to get Parliament to pass what they called the People's Charter. And the People's Charter was a proposed set of six political reforms. First, votes for all men over 21 regardless of whether they own property or how much property they own, right? At the time, in 1838, only land, only property owners were permitted to vote. Second, a secret ballot. Yes, believe it or not, in Victorian England, when you voted, everybody knew who you voted for. Right, your vote was recorded in a book, rather than simply like you know cast in a little box or by pulling a little lever or you know simply you didn't even go behind a curtain, right? You declared who you were going to vote for. So secret ballot would protect your identity if you voted for somebody who was not the approved candidate of the local power structure, right? Third, that there should be no property requirement for members of parliament, right? You shouldn't have to own property in order to be able to stand for election. Fourth, and this is related to point number three, that there should be a salary paid to members of parliament. Um, at this time, anybody who served in parliament did so without pay, right? Legislators uh, were volunteering their time, essentially, right? So <clears throat> we complain a lot about how much legislators are paid, right? That they're paid too much, or that you know, their pay is outrageous, they're raising tax dollars, or whatever, right? But why would working class people in particular want there to be a salary for MPs? If MPs work for free, what does that mean about who can be a member of parliament? It has to be some money or has money. Yeah. If you're not already independently wealthy, right? If you're someone who has to work, you can't afford to take a couple months out, months off out of the year, right? And go serve in parliament. So this issue of a salary for MPs is also one about equity here, right? Because it would allow working people to stand for election and not have to suffer months of lost wages, right? They also proposed the elimination of what were called rotten boroughs. An apportionment of districts based on population. Now we've talked about this before, but I'm not, it's been a while. 
Does anybody remember what rotten burrows were? Small rural areas? Yeah, they were small rural districts with sparse, they were sparsely populated, where there were maybe only two or three people who could vote at all, right? Who actually met the requirements to vote. However, these rotten boroughs got just as much representation as, you know, say an industrial city in the north, right? So, you know, when you've got, you know, rural Dorset sending as many people to Parliament as Manchester, right? This creates a problem for Manchester, right? This isn't fair to Manchester. This, by the way, is a problem that we have in, that particularly plagues um, our electoral system, right? Where, you know, a vote in Wyoming where nobody lives, or where hardly anybody lives, is worth more than a vote in California, right? That, you know, Wyoming gets equal representation in the Senate, for example, to a state that has 50 times its population. So, <clears throat> The sixth proposed reform here annual parliamentary elections. Right, the members of parliament should have to stand for re election every year, face the voters every year, and that this would be a way to keep the political class accountable. Now, the People's Charter itself probably predictably failed, right? None of this became law, at least not immediately. However, over the course of the 19th century, various parts of this become law, right? For example, Britain now has universal suffrage. Um, I believe the voting age there is still 21 but I'm not sure about that. It might be 18. Uh, the secret ballot is eventually adopted. There is currently no property requirement for MPs. MPs are paid. Um, to some extent, the rotten boroughs problem has been dealt with. The one thing that's never been dealt with or adopted is this idea of annual parliamentary elections. I think, and again, I'm not quite sure that they're, I think they have to have elections every five years but they can otherwise hold elections anytime they want, right? So the prime minister is permitted, um, whenever he feels it's particularly advantageous to do so, like if he thinks his party will pick up seats if they hold an election now, right? Boris Johnson could call an election tomorrow and say, okay, you know, we're, you know, <clears throat> I think my party's gonna gain seats, we're gonna have an election. Elections are also trigger, triggered if the party in power has a vote of no confidence in the prime minister. And then there's an immediate election. But yeah, annual parliamentary elections were something that never happened, right? But the reason we discuss this, or the reason I talk about this, is because it tells us something about the relative level of power working people had in Britain in the 19th century. And just how far politically reform had to go, right? You know, we're again talking about a society that basically that does, you know, countenance child labor, right? And to get back to that issue of child labor, right? We find it shocking. We find it hard to take and hard to swallow. To a Victorian audience, the bigger challenge was getting them to care, right? To the average Victorian, child labor was a normal fact of life. So we're dealing here with a different worldview, right? The idea that there's any such thing as a child is a relatively modern one, right? Historically, at least in you know, Western societies, children, once they are old enough to fend for themselves, right, you know, once they, they, they can you know, walk and do things for them, and talk and do things for themselves, are basically little adults. Right? And they help out <clears throat> with whatever work it is the family does, right? You know, so if you're in a trades family, you know, you're helping mom and dad, uh, 
um, you know, with the weaving or you know the goldsmithing or whatever it is they're doing from a pretty early age, right? Um, if your family lives on a farm, right, you're helping out with the farm work pretty much as soon as you can walk and carry things, right? It's only in around the late 18th century that the child as a separate category of development really begins to emerge. And a lot of this has to do with the rise of, uh, with a rise in schooling, right? The children of the aristocracy and the middle class are sent to school, um, ostensibly, you know, to learn classics, uh, composition, philosophy, or, you know, the kinds of things that have traditionally been attached to an upper to upper middle class liberal arts education, right? But what this means is that they're being taken, like upper middle class and middle class children are not spending their formative years working. They're spending their formative years doing something else, right? And so this idea of a child at least originates as an upper and middle class idea. Now why might the same notion of child as a specially protected and innocent category of being not apply to the poor and the working classes? Yeah, they couldn't afford to have a member of the family not employed, right, not working for, you know, for 12 years, right? So, <clears throat> working class children, at the same time that their upper class and middle class peers are being educated, are most, for, for the most part, going to work, right? And if home industries are dying in the face of industrialization, that means they're going out to work in factories, in mines, right, in the sorts of places where their parents are working. So a lot of these reform movements, like the Children's Employment Commission, are often based on middle class assumptions. about who should be working and who shouldn't. Now, I am not, by the way, trying to defend child labor here, right? I am not trying to suggest that you should have all spent your formative years pushing carts in a mine, right? What I am trying to get you to understand here is why it took so long to reform these attitudes, right, and to reform the laws to keep children out of employment. And a lot of the resistance came, and a lot of the resistance expectedly, you know, expectedly came from the owners of factories and mining operations, right? They liked hiring women and children because they didn't have to pay them as much. Because they weren't expected to be the breadwinner for a whole family. However, there was also often a good deal of resistance from middle class families themselves, not from, from working class families themselves, right? Now, why do you think that would be? Why would working class families resist laws that would keep their children from going to work in a factory or in the mine? Yeah, if you're already just scraping by, right? And everybody in the family is an earner. 
if you are legally barring certain members of the family from working, and you're not doing anything to replace that lost income, right, legally, by, say, you know, raising wages or something like that, then you're lowering the standard of living for people who are already living near the bottom, right? So <clears throat> the reason I bring this up is because like we, when we look at Victorian Britain, right, you know, through the lens of popular culture, like a lot of it kind of looks to us like the Muppets Christmas Carol, right? You know, this, you know, snowy London scenes of, you know, eccentric characters, you know, you know, walking around, um, learning moral lessons and things like that, right? But a lot of it is propped up by a really dark, seamy underbelly, right? Uh, of predominantly invisible labor. And there are writers and artists who try to draw attention to a lot of this. Though even, you know, their, their work only goes so far and, you know, doesn't draw quite the attention that it perhaps could. So I want to look, uh, you know, along those lines at the Charles Dickens piece that I had you read for today, Coke Town. But go to page 645. Um, <clears throat> can I get somebody to start reading the first paragraph here? From, it was a town of red brick. <clears throat> It was a town of red brick, or a brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But as matters stood, it was a town of unnatural red and black like the painted face of a savage. It was a town of machinery and tall chimneys, out of which interminable uh, serpents of smoke mm -hmm. trailed themselves forever and ever, and never got on coral. It had a black canal in it, and a river that ran purple with ill-smelling dye, and vast piles of buildings full of windows where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long, and where windows were, <clears throat> where there was a rattling and a trembling all day long, and were where the piston of the steam engine worked <clears throat> monotonously, up and down like the head of an elephant in a state of melancholy madness. And <clears throat> it contains several large streets, all very like one another, and many small streets still more like one another, inhabited by people equally like one another, who all went in and out as, at the same hours with the same sound upon the same pavements to do the same work and to whom every day was the same day as yesterday, and tomorrow and every year the counterpart of the land and the next. Okay, thank you. So this is an excerpt from a novel called Hard Times that is particular, it's unusual for Dickens novels and the Dickens is usually concerned primarily with life in London. Um, this novel is about the industrial north. In particular, it's about uh, um, it, it's, it's, the, the town seems to be based on Preston, um, the big textile milling town in Lancashire. So um, what impressions of this town do we get from this first paragraph? What, is, how, what does this place look like? What, what struck you about this? Okay. Can you, uh, can you elaborate a little bit? Um, like he talks about how all the birds are the same, the worlds are very similar. Uh -huh. The streets are very similar, even smaller ones, and how each person does the exact same thing. There's no individuality. Yeah, everything here is uniform, right? Everything here from the streets to the buildings to the people seems to be built from the same template, right? Good. What else do you notice about this, about this town? Yeah. And, the uh, small streets, um, I mentioned it's like the big chimneys, which could be just um, like a lot of industry buildings, like uh -huh. for like the coal or anything like that would call 
else move when he said just burning okay. buildings. Yeah, the, the, yeah the, the big chimneys suggest lots of burning things, right? Yeah. Can we, well, yeah, let, let, let's, let's get some examples here of the pollution. Where do we see pollution here? Uh, there's air pollution, there's also uh, the river. Uh huh. Yeah, um, the, the river running purple. Let's actually pause on that for a, for a second, right? Does that look at all like anything you're familiar with? Maybe from the book of Exodus, or if you're not familiar with the book of Exodus, from the movie The Ten Commandments. Ten Plagues of Egypt. The Nile running red with blood. Yeah, that's what's being referenced here, right? What, what else do, uh, where else do we see pollution here? What, what, what other examples do we have here of pollution? Um, talking about other scratches and stuff on the building building. Okay, yeah, there's ash and soot everywhere, right? And I do want to point to that first sentence of the paragraph along those lines, right? Um, I don't like this last phrase because of its, you know, sort of, it has some racist connotations, frankly. But I want to draw attention to what the comparison is doing here, right? So it's a, it was a town of red brick, or of brick that would have been red if the smoke and ashes had allowed it. But as matters stood, it was a town of unnatural red and black, like the painted face of a savage, right? So what's being paired here is the ultra-modern, right, the model company town. With a primitive state of cultural development, right? Right. In particular, the phrase savage often connotes not just primitivism, but also violence, right? Good. Anything else you do? Do you notice anything about like the comparisons or the, the like other comparisons or metaphors that are used throughout this paragraph to talk about the machines or the buildings or Melancholy. <laughs> okay, so yeah, me yeah, melancholy. Does everybody know what melancholy is? Sort of a sad. Uh, we, yeah, we, we often use melancholy to mean sad, but in um, Pre-Freudian psychology. And it's like kind of dark. -ish. Yeah, we think of melancholy as being kind of dark mood, right? There are basically two ways uh, to define it, right? The first is that it's a kind of artistically pleasant sadness. So. Or as a student of mine uh, defined it a couple of years ago, hipster sadness. Right? You know, think about you know, like young men in velvet jackets and frilly cravats sitting around drinking absinthe and feeling sad about the state of the universe, but enjoying it. Right? So melancholy is a form of sadness that is artistically or aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing in some way. But that doesn't really sound appropriate for what's going on here, right? The elephant in the state of melancholy madness, right? The other thing that melancholy meant in pre-Freudian psychology was something like bipolar. 
right? Somebody who suffered from melancholy suffered from a condition that was not unlike bipolar disorder, right? So, you know, furious bursts of energy coupled with long periods of depression and low energy, right? So that's probably what he means here in talking about this machine, right? That, you know, it you know, goes and goes and goes and goes and stops and then goes and goes and goes and goes and then stops, right? But yeah, so what that he compares it to an elephant? Is that the only animal comparison we see here? Yeah, we have the elephants and the machines and the serpents of smoke, right? So I think if we're compa he's comparing animals, right, natural animals, to machines and the products of machines, right? And I think, again, like to kind of demonstrate that the only things we see, like even, you know, nature here, is completely dominated by the machine, right? In this place, the machine is natural. Pollution is natural, if that makes sense. Okay, so can I get somebody to continue reading for us from these attributes of Coketown were in the main inseparable? These attributes Thank you. of Coketown were in the main oh God. inseparable from the work from the word by which it was sustained. Against him were to be set off comforts of little which found their way all over the world. And in ele elegancies. Elegancies of life which made, we will not ask how much of the fine lady who could scarce scarcely bear to hear the place mentioned. The rest of its features were voluntary, and there were these. Okay, and stop there, for, right? We want to pause here for a second. So what do we notice here about what's produced in Coketown? Is what's produced in Coketown consumed in Coketown? Uh, yep, all over the world, right? Elegancies of life that go to the fine ladies throughout the kingdom, right? And what is the attitude of the people who are consuming Coketown's products towards Coketown? Yeah, they can scarcely bear to hear the place mentioned, right? So, you know, don't tell me about where this frock coat that I'm wearing came from, right? Don't want to know about that. I just care about how good it looks and what, what it costs, right? Does this sound familiar at all? Where else have we heard this? Slavery. Yeah, Coleridge talking about sugar, right? Where the labor that produces the sugar is invisible to the consumers of that sugar, right? Not because they don't know what's going on, but because they're kind of willfully ignoring what's going on, right? Now, I am not comfortable with the kinds of comparisons to slavery that were common in the Victorian period regarding uh, you know, wage work, um, as brutal as it was, right? I think that people like um, Annie Besant and the passage about the London match workers, I think they're making that they're making that mistake that people often do about condition and state, right? So do we remember from when we talked about Olamuda Aquiano and Mary Prince what we're talking about when we talk about the condition and the state of slavery? What's the difference between condition and state when we're talking about slavery? Yeah, the condition is, yeah, the material conditions uh, 
under which you live, the state is your legal status, yes. So while it is true that <clears throat> the people of Coketown and the London match workers are treated abominably, and they are not given the full rights of British citizens, they're still legally free, right? They're not legally bound to any particular employer or place of employment, right? For one thing, they can be fired. In fact, they are often made to support the political projects here um, of their employers. Now, I want to turn to the Annie Fassan article for a second here. If you look on page 651, and this is a relatively late example. Right? This is 1888, right? So this is getting on towards the end of the Victorian period, and it kind of shows how little progress is made in 50 years. I want you guys to look on page 651, and can somebody read to me the paragraph that starts with, a very bitter memory survives in the factory. A very bitter memory survives in the factory. Mr. Theodore Bryant, to show his admiration of Mr. Gladstone and the greatness of his own public spirit, be thought. Be thought. And to erect a statue to eminent statesmen in order that his work girls might have the privilege of contributing. He stopped one, oh, what does that mean? One second. One, uh, one, one shilling. Each out of their wages and further deprived them of half a day's work by closing the factory, giving them a holiday, which we don't want no holiday, said one of the girls pathetically. For needless to say, the, prop, the poor employees of such a firm lose, lose their wages when a holiday is given. Okay, so let's pause there, right? So what is the guy who owns the mash factory doing to pay for this statue of a politician he admires? He's yeah, he's docking his workers' pay so he can build the statue, right? And then why don't they want the holiday that he gives them? Because they don't get paid. Yeah, it's not a paid holiday, right? It's not a paid vacation, right? If, they, if he gives them a day off, they're losing money. So he takes the day off to celebrate this statue, right? While the girls in the match factory, <clears throat> basically who've paid for the statue, <laughs> essentially have to take yet another day where their pay is docked. So he can kind of at will decide to take money away from them to support his own pet projects, right? And they don't, you know, they protest, but they don't really have the rights to do anything about this. So, it, would, it might help to understand some of what's going on here if we talk a little bit more about some of the changes that happen in England by the 1830s um, that lead to these kinds of industrial conditions, right? So we've already talked about the Enclosure Acts, right? This we should know by now. Uh, remind me, what, are the, what were the Enclosure Acts? Turn public lands into um, business lands. Yeah, essentially you, you take rural villages, right? And you take what used to be common land, these old village greens, and you divide it up into uh, sheep folds or cattle ranches or things like that, right? You use it for raising livestock instead of for people to do their normal planting garden or whatever. Um, so this moves a lot of people off the land into the cities, right? 
So the enclosure acts lead to mass urbanization and rural depopulation. Now, we also have, with steam power, revolutions in transportation. Right? The railroad and the steamship make getting around faster and arguably safer than it used to be. Now, the other effect the railroad has and I think we might have touched on this um, a couple weeks ago, but it's, it bears repeating. Another effect the railroad has is standardization of time. If you live on a farm, how much does precise timekeeping matter? in your work day? Not much. Yeah, not really, right? You, you, you get up at sunrise, you do the work that is best done in the cool of the morning, right? Then you know when the sun reaches its zenith, it gets hot, you take a break, you have something to eat, maybe go indoors for a little while. You go out and you do a little more work. When the sun goes down, you come in, you eat dinner, do whatever it is you do in the intervening time before you go to sleep, right? Precise hours don't really matter all that much. Now, why would a railroad require standardized measures of time? Yeah, you need to know when the train is supposed to arrive and when it's supposed to leave, right? You need to be able to track arrivals and departures precisely. So that people know when to show up at the station, right? And, what, and when they're likely to reach their destinations. So each station across England has to keep more or less the same time, right? Because if one station's measurement of time is off, it throws off the whole schedule for the whole railroad, right? Now this logic then gets transported to the factory. Right? People are thinking about time differently due to the introduction of railroads. And so, the standardization of time leads to the standardization of hourly wages, right? <clears throat> you know, when you're a farm laborer, you get paid for the day's work, right? But how long is a day? How many hours is that? Factory owners wanted more precise measurements of time so they knew more or less how much work they were paying people for, right? And it was not uncommon for people to work days of 12 hours or more, right? If you were a factory worker in Victorian Britain, you were spending most of your time at that factory, no matter how old you were. Children, women and children often work the night shifts. Men tended to work the day shifts. And in some industries, uh, women and children were actually dominant, right? For example, you know, why might children have been particularly desirable to mining companies? They could fit in the small places. Exactly. Yeah, children don't, didn't have to bend down in tunnels, right? Right? There's a reason why mining as a profession has tended to favor short workers. Um, <clears throat> a lot of, company, a lot of uh, companies also wanted children to work machines because their hands could fit into small places that adult hands couldn't. And children were often more dexterous and could get more work done on, say, like a power loom. So,
The other thing that changed that drove more people into these kinds of factories uh, were changes in what was called the British Poor Law. So when we talk about the Poor Law, um, we're talking about essentially provisions uh, for social welfare for those who are, for whatever reason, unable to support themselves, right? Now traditionally, this was done on, you know, kind of like the town or county level, and people were supported in their own homes, right? You know, whatever aid they were supposed to get was simply brought to them at home by local officials. But by the late 18th century, um, people want to see the poor being more quote unquote productive. And so instead of taking care of them in their own homes, if you can't support yourself, you are taken uh, to what's called a workhouse. And this is where things get all of a twist here. So in the workhouse, you are given a place to sleep and you're given enough to eat to keep yourself alive. But in exchange, uh, you have to work at a particular task um, for very, very little money, right? And most of the tasks that they put people to in the workhouses were actually pretty much pointless, right? This wasn't, um, they weren't doing useful labor. They were being made to work for the sake of being made to work, basically, right? So like one of the most common activities in a workhouse setting was what was called oakum picking. So oakum is a substance that's used to coat ropes that can also be used um, to make tar to cover ships, right? Uh, like, you know, to prevent, uh, to seal up ships so they don't leak. Um, <clears throat> so they would have people sitting on benches in long rows at tables with bits of old rope and hooks and they would have to take these hooks, tear apart the ropes. Like, have, you ever, have any of you guys ever like shredded, a, like shredded chicken with a fork? It works kind of like that, right? You just you take the hooks and you tear the rope apart, you tear the shreds apart, and then you pick out the little bits of oakum that are left, right? Now, it's difficult work, it's tedious work, and it was also pretty much useless because picking oakum off of ropes did not produce anywhere near enough to make coating for ships, right? So it was essentially a way of um, punishing people for being poor, right? So in order to avoid going to the workhouse, people would take just about any work they could get even if the uh, conditions were exploitative, right? Um, you know, even if the pay was less than desirable, even if the work was dangerous. And because most work was largely unregulated in Victorian Britain, there were very few safety laws. Um, most work was actually pretty dangerous. Um, now, I do want to look at this report from the Children's Employment Commission, in particular the commissioner's uh, commentary here on page 635. Uh, <laughs> so we can get a sense of what shocked the middle class. Um, so we've talked a bit about you know, the social conditions that created all of this. We've talked a bit about um, you know, how, you know, this sort of thing emerges in literature. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about how this affects the middle class worldview and the middle class conscience, right? So can I get somebody first to read the paragraph in which uh, Margaret Gomley, living at Lindley Moor, age 9, May 7th, uh, describes her working conditions. They call me Peggy for my nickname down here. 
but my right name is Margaret. I'm about nine years old or going nine. I have been at work in a pit thrusting corbs about a year. Come in the morning, sometimes at seven o'clock, sometimes half past seven, and I go sometimes home at six o'clock, sometimes at seven when I do overwork. Right. Children are working overtime. I get my breakfast of porridge before I come and bring a piece of muffin, which I eat on a coming to pit, eat on coming to pit. Mm -hmm. I get my dinner at 12 o'clock, which is a dry muffin and sometimes butter on it, but I have no time allowed to stop to eat. I eat it while I am thrusting the load. I get no tea, but get some supper when I get home, and then go to bed when I have washed me, and am very tired. I worked in the pit last winter. I don't know at what hour I went down as we have no clock, but it was daylight. It was <clears throat> six o'clock when I, <clears throat> when we came up, but not always. They flog us down in the pit, sometimes with their hands upon my bottom, which hurts me very much. Thomas, Cop yeah, Thomas Copeland flog flogs me more than anyone, <clears throat> more than once in a day, which makes me cry. There are two other girls working with me, and there was four, but one left because she had the bellyache. I am poorly myself sometimes with bellyache and sometimes headache. I had rather lake than go into the pit. I get five pence a day, but I had rather set cards for five pence a day than go into the pit. The men often swear at me. Many times they say, damn thee, and other times, god damn thee, as such, <clears throat> and such like Peggy. Okay, so first, to get a sense of what kind of work this nine-year-old girl is doing, right? if we look on page 634, the bottom illustration, right? you see um, a, someone thrusting a corvée, right? a corvée being a cart filled with coal. So this little girl, is thrusting and parts is pushing parts full of coal uh, for 12 hours a day. Now, what do you notice about the way she describes her conditions? And what are the things that seem to trouble her the most? Yeah, I guess you could say not knowing the time at first, but what is um, the flogs? What is flogs? He, yeah, he's hitting her, right? She, okay. she, she's being hit, yeah. And then she would rather lake than go in the pit? Play hooky. Oh, uh, okay. But yeah, I guess, um, like right there, sometimes with their hand <coughs> upon my bottom, um, like she really doesn't like that. Um, yeah, she, yeah she, essentially they're being spanked, right? They're being punished by being spanked. Having headaches, belly aches, uh, uh -huh. probably not getting um, any breaks, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, being forced, um, I don't know, like probably not being able to eat, stomach hurting. Yeah. Uh, probably just being there too much. Yeah, I mean, she notes that she is often poorly with the headache and the bellyache, right? The headache, likely from breathing in fumes all the time, and the bellyache, uh, you know, from having to eat, you know, like a soot-covered muffin down in the pit uh, for lunch every day. Now, note, too, and remember that this is, like, the commission is aiming this at an audience of middle-class reformers, right? So what about... Peggy's description of her life would be particularly offensive to the, yeah, the, the harassment, the slapping the children, right? And what else? Why do you think she, why do you think the commissioner's point in the uh, report in particular notes the bad language that the men use in the pit? It's not Christian. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it's, it's vulgar, right? So not only are children being hit, 
what this ends with is the thing that would probably actually more likely offend middle class Victorian sensibilities, right? That men in the pit are using bad language around children, right? So we have to look at this with a certain level of class consciousness, right? This is a working class little girl, but we've got an upper middle class official taking down her words in order to share them with other middle class officials, right? So <clears throat> it's taken down in such a way as to be particularly upsetting to that particular audience, right? Now, can I get somebody to read uh, C Commissioner Scriven's commentary below this? So with, I descended this pit. I descended this pit accompanied by one of the banksmen and on alighting at the bottom from the entrance to the main way, 10 feet, 2 feet, 10 inches, and which extended 500 yards. The bottom was deep in mire, and I have no corpse? Corvées. Corvées low enough to convey me to the workings, waited some time under the dripping shop, the arrival of the hurriers. But I reason to suspect that there were some very young children laboring there. At length, three girls arrived with as many boys. It was impossible in the dark to distinguish the sexes. They were all naked, except in their shifts or shirts. Having placed one onto the cord, I gave the signal and ascended. On alighting on the pit's bank, I discovered that it was a girl. I could not believe that I should have found the human nature so degraded. There is nothing that I there's nothing that I can see amidst all the misery and wretchedness in the worst factories equal to this. Mr. Harvoy, solicitor, and Mr. Brooks, surgeon, practicing in Stalin, were present, who confessed that although living within miles, they could not have believed such a system of unchristian cruelty could have existed. So once again, we see that this is invisible, right, to pe even to people who live nearby. Um, you know, and. You know, in, in part, probably, you know, Mr. Holroyd and Mr. Brooke never really bothered to inquire, right? Um, but what else do we notice about the commissioner's commentary? What are the things that seem to worry him most? Human nature so degraded. Yeah, he says, human nature so degraded. And what, is, what does he find degrading here? What specifically in his report upsets him? Yeah, it seems to bother him that he can't tell, that they're, they're naked and he can't tell the boys from the girls, right? That you have children of both genders down in a mine, more or less naked, and you can't tell who's who, right? So he seems to regard kind of like binary genders as sort of a definition of civilization, right? Um, if we think of this in the same terms that Dickens is writing about Coketown, right? When he talks about Coketown being painted with soot like the face of a savage, right? We're talking again here about a kind of regression of civilization. Right. The idea the commissioner is trying to uh, get across is this notion of civilization moving backwards, degrading, right? So that indu industrial progress is wedded to a kind of dehumanization, where like anything that distinguishes these children from each other is erased, right? They're all just the same. They're this undifferentiated mass down in a pit working 12-hour days. And again, remember, I think you know, part of what's going on, again, with pointing out that you can't tell the genders apart here, is that he's trying to reach an audience that would be particularly offended by this, right? That will be bothered by there not being a separation of the sexes here. Because the middle class tends to be more conservative about such things than either the aristocracy or the working class. So, I also do want you to keep this particular passage in mind when we're reading Dickens for next time, right? There's going to be a part in A Christmas Carol. So everybody is more or less familiar with A Christmas Carol, right? This is a story that everybody feels like they know, right? Everybody's at least seen one movie that airs around the holidays that is based on this. 
short novel. Okay, so if you've seen a movie version, particularly if it's like The Muppets or some shit like that, right? That is not an excuse not to read it, okay? Please do still do the reading. But there is a passage in which the ghost of Christmas present opens up his robe and there are these two hideous, nearly naked children clinging to each other underneath it, right? He calls them ignorance and want. So I want you to keep this commission report in mind as you read that passage in particular, right? Does anybody have any questions about anything else before I give you guys the reading questions for next time? I know this is really pretty depressing stuff to come back to. This is not, not exactly a big on uplift today. All right, then let me give you the questions for next time, and then I will let you go. Everybody, everybody got their exam back and the bibliography, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Hannah. What were you gonna say? I was like, can you be nice and not give us a quiz on Wednesday with a 59-page long excerpt? Please. <laughs> I'm. I, I'm not gonna say like. I am not gonna say anything as to whether I will give a quiz or not. That's way too much to read. 59 pages. It's not. It, it's not a particularly difficult read. I did.